afternoon. Um, my name is Sarah Dwan from Graduate School of International Studies here. And um, I'm going to talk about um, how Korea's development cooperation strategy can be enhanced through engaging more non-state actors, especially in terms of humanitarian assistance. So as, um, well, I already have the answer <laughs> in the diagram. As you can see, Korea stands as a unique place, like a buffer zone between the developed countries and the developing countries um, in terms of how it turned once from a recipient to now a member of the um, donor countries. So, and to explain further, Korea is both engaged in um, OEC Development Assistance Committee as well as NICTA, which is a group of five middle powers, um, five middle powers um, that have um, foreign minister-led meetings um, annually. So, in this sense, um, Korea is often referred to as the middle power, not just in the meaning of the size of the country per se, but um, more focused on its role in the international setting. And middle power status is um, also shaped by non-traditional security issues such as environment, like in the case of Canada or Norway, or technology and development assistance, um, which in the case of Korea it's um, ODA. And um, in terms of connecting middle power and aid policy, uh, it can be said that it's aid policy is an important means of middle power diplomacy in case of Korea because the foreign policy objective, uh, which is to become the middle power that contributes to the pros prosperity of mankind, it aligns with the aims of um, development cooperation, which is uh, also related to um, creating global public goods and ensuring um, a nation's stature and prestige. And this is um, the importance of development cooperation. It's particularly um, has been never been more emphasized um, than before because now there is um, frequent um, the frequency of humanitarian crisis. It's um, becoming there is more and more occurrence on what um, either man-made or natural disasters, and there is also a growing gap between funding requirement and people in need. So. Um, and regarding that, there are some um, key international agendas addressing this, this expansion of non-traditional security, which aligns with how middle power um, powers are shaped um, through the behaviors on dealing with such security issues. So with this in mind, thinking of how the direction of um, um, Korea's development cooperation strategy should head, I came up with these three questions. And um, in order to unfold the questions, I've, uh, I've came up with a comparative analysis between Korea and Australia. And the reason why I selected Australia as a counterpart um, analysis is that both countries are middle powers, and they are both members of MICTA and OECD DOC, and they do have the similar economy size and the location as well. But um, while I was looking through the analysis between um, comparing the two development cooperation policies, I found that Australia, in terms of ODAs and humanitarian assistance, it's um, the country seemed to be doing quite well. And while the Korea, which shares so much commonalities, was not actually making um, the the requirement, um, I'd say. Their, um, Korea was not really doing well, as it claims to be. And also, another founding um, that I, um, I came up with is Australia's development cooperation policies were integrated into the public diplomacy strategies, um, which enabled the country to both efficiently and effectively interact with audiences both inside and outside the country, while Korea's um, public diplomacy strategy and the ODA strategy were very fragmented. And last but not least, Australia was active in humanitarian assistance by engaging non-state actors, namely civil society organizations, which I'll go through over the next few slides. So to begin with Korea, um, these are the key foreign um, policy goals that uh, Minister of Foreign Affairs um, posed. 
And you can see that the goal of becoming a middle power um, and the goal of expanding public diplomacy are separate. And in terms of public diplomacy, um, the Ministry of Foreign Affairs, it emphasizes the role of culture in terms of promoting the national image that matches the, um, the, the Korea of today. So that's quite, um, so the middle power diplomacy strategy and, and the public diplomacy strategy were not in line with. And in terms of um, Korea's ODA, um, two ministries of very different characteristics are in charge of providing the aid. So one would be Ministry of Foreign Affairs that has more to do with grants, while Ministry of Strategy and Finance um, uh, it deals with more concessional loans um, through the EBCF. And, um, but how, and also the thing that I wanted to point out from here is that um, regarding how um, fast Korea's ODA grew, um, there's a gap uh, there's a gap found between what Korea aims to be and what Korea has been doing. So in terms of what Korea aims to be, as you can see um, in, in the accounts of um, former President Lee myung bak or the pr former Prime Minister Chung Hoon saying that they are trying to promote some global Korea, the idea of global Korea, as well as some more um, contextualized development projects called Win Win ODA towards the recipient to the developing countries. But on the other hand, um, Korea faces, still faces these kind of issues. So to begin with, um, the numbers and index show that um, in terms of the ODA expenditure, it's quite in the, on the bottom of the um, OECD doc members. And as well as um, the fragment, the problem of fragmentation is quite serious in terms of um, aid delivery, as well as um, implementing the ODA because um, other than Minister of Foreign Affairs and Minister of Strategy and Finance, um, there are more than over 44 institutions involved in, in, in sporadically implementing the ODA, which all led to aid ineffectiveness. And also, um, another thing to, um, to point out is that Korea's ODA projects are quite short term. And there's always this quick change of focus based on the change of the government. For example, um, during um, Lee myung Bak's government, um, the focus was green growth. But now, once the regime changed, it's more of suddenly got um, more towards some um, Korea aid, Korean model of aid towards African continent, which um, has some issues on ownership and local context. And also, last but not least, um, this lack of humanitarian assistance was um, critic was criticized by the other um, DAC members through the peer review of having how the, the low rate of assistance as well as how it's tilted towards emergency relief and lack of um, cross-government policies as well. So in in that in this sense, Korea's ODA has not really. Um, doing well in terms of how it's trying to promote it as a key strategy as to become a middle power. So now we turn to um, Australia. And um, in terms of foreign policy goals, Australia, um, as you can see, focuses, um, it has emphasized emphasis on the um, building some partnership between government and non-governmental organizations and other sectors in the society. And, um, about Australia's ODA, um, Department of Foreign Affairs and Trade, it, um, that's the um, institution that only oversees the ODA. But one another interesting thing was that Australia's ODA was actually integrated into um, public uh, diplomacy strategy. And their, um, their objective was to increase the visibility and understanding of the aims and values of Australian aid to both domestic and international audience through integration and targeting. And, um, and another um, characteristic of Australia's ODA was, uh, is the, it's the leading donor in humanitarian assistance. And so as you can see, the, the expenditure for humanitarian assistance that Australia uses, it's three times uh, more than Korea spends. 
And the areas of humanitarian assistance for um, Australia is also diverse, including the disaster reduction, um, risk reduction, and preparedness, other than the emergency relief. And here, um, one of the important um, factors of Australia's ODA is the Im importance of non-state actors. Through these um, four exemplary um, uh, cases, uh, which I would have loved to um, more, uh, provide more details, but in terms of due to the time limit, I'll have to um, sum up as these four examples, they all show the importance of network between the government and the, uh, the civil society organizations, both inside and outside the country. And in, in one of the, um, in one of the program, which is the NGO, uh, Australian NGO Cooperation Program, it actually um, has it works through more than 5,000 partners in developing countries, including private sector organizations, NGOs, and the governments themselves. So that was how um, Australia's Australian government um, actually got benefited from such networks, uh, networking through the development cooperation. So to um, sum up the anal um, analysis, um, I, uh, it, by looking at Korea's case and Australia's case, can be seen that can be suggested that development cooperation within public diplomacy seems more consistent, coherent, and it has it seems to carry more, much more clear objectives. And in doing so, it would facilitate the country's effort to realize its mid-term and long-term foreign policy objectives as well. And in terms of um, not only just and not only just engaging the non-state actors into the development assistance, um, it it would not only scale up the funds, and, but it would also bring more networks into the into the cooperation system. And um, uh, and the last two slides, um, um, actually not last two, but Last three slides. Um, I, uh, I. This is like the framework that I wanted to um, present in in the paper by using how by seeing real power um, from the network perspective, and by using the three for forms of network power um, suggested: social power, brokerage power, and designing power. I think um, um, using middle power, integrating middle power strategy into public diplomacy strategy is it's uh, more close to being a convener which brings together the states and non-state actors to work together for common understandings and interests and norms, which in the case of humanitarian assistance would be um, to, ch uh, to just challenge against those crises. And this is another, um, uh, another framework that I could refer to in terms of how non-state actors do have advantage in terms of um, collab being collaborative as well as um, setting up networks. And as a conclusion, um, I'd like to um, I'd like to make suggestions for um, in terms of how Korea can how Korea's um, ODA could develop um, into a much more um, relevant and more coherent one. Because I actually had a quotation from um, Kim Tae-won on how. Um, Korea's public diplomacy should be go should go beyond culture. Um, it should integrate Korea's development experience or Korea's development assistance into uh, uh, with securing the universal value against the humanitarian crisis and um, some effective humanitarian model um, uh, model could be uh, could come up as the important aspect of national branding itself and. Um, and I would like to maybe suggest some humanitarian partnership with non-state actors that's that's really that's relevant for Korea in case. Um, and I'll deal with case studies on private sector um, by utilizing their creating shared values uh, mechanism to talk about how they can be more involved um, into making this um, development cooperation much more. Um, uh, much more <laughs> how they can facilitate the cooperation and 
also for civil society on um, maybe um, talking about um, how World Friends Korea could um, be improved in terms of how Australia's um, uh, international volunteers were doing so. So this is the end of my presentation. Thank you.